psalmist says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. All my help comes from the Lord. When we look back over our lives and see how good God has been to us, we just can't help but to give him praise. Just look at what the Lord has done for you. He brought you safely through another year. And that's reason enough to give him praise. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And we've come to give him praise for all that he's done for us. Come on, saints, let's praise him. Look how far we've come with the Lord. Oh, just look how far. Look how far we've come oh. with the Lord. Through our trials, through our trials, tribulations, tribulations persecution, 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 in a snare. Just look. And a hidden snare. Look how far we've come yes, with the Lord. Come on, let's give him praise right now. Look how far we've come yeah. with the Lord. Yes, look how far. Look how far we've come with the Lord. Well, we ought to be grateful for what God has done for us. We ought to not be ashamed to give him praise. We ought to stand up and say hallelujah for all the many blessings you've done for us. Thank you, Lord. Why you brought me? Thank you, Lord. Why you taught me? Thank you, Lord. Why you got me? Thank you, Lord. You never left me. Thank you, Lord. Why you brought me? Thank you, Lord. Why you taught me? Thank you. Why you got me? Thank you. You never left me. Thank you. For how you brought me. Thank you. For how you taught me. Thank you. For how you kept me. Thank you. You never left me. Thank you. How you brought me. How you taught me. Thank you. How you kept me. Thank you. You never left me. Why you brought me? Thank you. Why you taught me? Thank you. Why you kept me? Thank you. You never left me. Thank you. Why you brought me? Thank you. Why you taught me? Thank you, Jesus. Why you kept me? Thank you. You never left me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Once again, Happy New Year. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, our hearts are filled with adoration when we lift our eyes to you. For you are Lord of all creation. You make all things new. Lord, do a mighty work in our hearts today. Help us to see you in new and glorious ways. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, you can change our hearts. We stand ready for your outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of our members at 6th Avenue. Change our hearts anew, Lord. Lord, we lift our eyes to see your glory. We open our hearts to receive your love. We engage our minds to understand your truth. We offer our songs to praise your name. We praise you for all that you have given us. And we bless your name. Holy Lord, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, we commit all of our good deeds to you and ask that everything we do be done for your glory forever and forever. Amen. I know that he can 
Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. Our scripture reading is found in the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. Hear ye the word of God. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. 
I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him. And verse 11, And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. On this second Sunday in the new year of January 2021, I want you to go ahead and sign up, register for our congregational church meeting that will happen on Tuesday, January the 26th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. So I hope that you are looking at our website and, and other mediums such that you will be able to register for that meeting and we look forward to seeing you there. We want you to be aware of our following few individuals that we must be in prayer with. Gloria Ayers passed away. We want to be in prayer with her family during this time. A memorial service is being planned uh, in remembrance of her. We also want to remember of Sam Watley, our pianist. His father, Sam Watley Sr., passed away and graveside services uh, were held on Saturday at the Elmwood Cemetery. We want to continue to remember all those who are sick and shut in, especially those who are struggling with the COVID-19 and ask God's richest blessings to be upon them. We want to remember our pastor as he continues to lead our congregation in ministry. And we want to remember all of these concerns as God has allowed us to be a part of this community of faith. Will you bow with me in a time of prayer? Father in heaven, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for this moment. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of being a part of our congregation. And we pray, God, that your spirit will continue to reign in our hearts as we live, move, and have our being in you. We thank you, God, for those who are bereaved and are grieving and mourning in the life of our congregation. We pray, God, for the Watley family. We pray for the Ayers family. And we pray for those others that we may not even know of. God, we pray that you will comfort them that you will carry them during this sad time. But God, I pray that you will flood their hearts, their minds, their spirits with the presence of their loved ones. And God, once again, we say thank you for our pastor. And we pray, God, that you will continue to uh, lift up our pastor, John Cantelo III, and that you will continue to hide him behind the cross of Calvary as he proclaims the good news of the gospel, not only to us, but that he will also, Lord, pastor and shepherd this congregation as you lead him. Thank you, God, for the Sixth Avenue Church family. And pray, we pray, God, that you will continue to lead us to be ministers of the gospel wherever we are. We ask this all in the precious name of Christ our Lord. Let the people of God say together, Amen.
Would you like to get healthy this year? Well, you can because the 6th Avenue Sliders Line Dance Fitness Ministry meets every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon at the state-of-the-art Fountain Heights Recreation Center. The sliders follow CDC guidelines by standing 6 to 12 feet apart, wearing masks, and sanitizing hands. Join us. You can lose weight and become a new you in 2021. For additional information, call Lois Germany at 205-791-2706. Hope to see you there. Standing there thinking about it, yeah. taking a look back over my life, Lord, yes, Lord. and you show me yes, mighty good to me when I was down and out. Yeah. Lord, I didn't have a dime. Yes, sir. You made a way for me yes, sir. so, so, so many times, and you brought me. From a mighty, a mighty, mighty long way, yeah. Oh, 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 you've been good. You've been good to me. You've been good. You've been good to me. Yeah, you've been good. You've been good to me. You've been good. You've been good to me. And master, you've been a mother. Been a mother for me. And Jesus, you've been a father. Yes, you didn't leave me. You stood right by my side, yeah. And when my troubles came, right. Right. you dried the tears from my eyes. I could have been dead, yes, sir. sleeping in my grave. But you made, 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 made my in a minute. And you brought me, me from a mighty, mighty long way. Say thank you. Thank you. God, you brought me. You brought me. Oh, from a mighty, from a mighty, mighty long way. From a mighty long way. Yeah. You brought me. You brought me from a mighty long way. You brought me. You brought me from a mighty long way.
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you on uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, at this time, we're going to look at the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, and verses 27 through 33. Again, that's the gospel according to St. Mark. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, and verses 27 through 33. Of course, it's there on your screen, and we're coming out of the NIV version. Okay, from the Word of God. <clears throat> on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, they heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. All right, verse 27, it's the next day. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why did you believe? Then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, by implication, they said, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. Verse 33, so they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God say amen, amen, amen. The subject of our sharing uh, this morning, my brothers and sisters, is a house of prayer or a den of thieves? A house of prayer or a den of thieves? Let's go to God in prayer. Children of God, our Father, once again, Lord, we have assembled before you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for this medium of technology. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, because of your grace, you have called us together to be one family, one fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are your disciples, Lord. We are your followers. We believe in you. We trust uh, in you. We trust in your word. And right now, Lord, as we open the book and as we sit down before you, we ask, Lord, that in a very real sense, you will teach us like you taught your disciples so many centuries ago, Lord. Right now, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, you would speak to our minds, and that you would show us what you would have us to say, what you would have us to know, what you would have us to do, and what you would have us to share with others as it concerns your eternal word. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Uh, let the church say, let the people of God say amen. Again, my brothers and sisters, the subject of our sharing this morning is a house of prayer or a den of thieves? A house of prayer or a den of thieves? My brothers and sisters, as I said on last week when I came out of this text, the reason that the religious leaders, and what we're talking about here, we're talking about the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And I want you to understand that these men were teachers of the word of God. All right. The reason that the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus was because Jesus was interfering with their money making enterprise and because of his influence and because of his popularity among the people. 
You know, it was that age old contest where you try to hold on to both your money and your power. And that's what we see in our text this morning. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, again, these were teachers of the word of God in their day. They were a, a religious mafia of sorts. And these kind of people, they didn't want you messing with their money or their uh, customer base or their standing or their privileged status that they had in their culture, in their society. And so when they heard that Jesus had driven their merchants out of the temple. And I want you to understand that the only way that these merchants could have gotten in the temple was that they had to gain permission, all right, from the chief priests and the teachers of the law. When the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law, when they had heard that Jesus had driven the merchants out of the temple and that he would not allow anyone to buy or sell there, uh, they had had enough. Man, they were fed up. They already could not stand Jesus, but now they were gathering a consensus among themselves to kill him. Why? Because, again, Jesus was messing with their money and he was messing with their power. My brothers and sisters, that's one of the reasons I believe Jesus told his disciples early on in his ministry in Matthew, the sixth chapter. He said something very important. He said to his disciples, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust, nor vermin destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal, he said, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But he went on to say something even more important. He said to them, he said, no one can serve two masters. He said, either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one or despise the other. But Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and money. And later on in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse 10, Paul himself said he seemed to echo the sentiments of Jesus. Paul said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so when Jesus went into the temple on that day and he drove out the merchants and he would not allow anyone to buy or sell there, he said, he said, my house, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Why? Because you love money more than you love God or the truth for that matter. Oh man, they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill him. So the day after Jesus drove out the merchants. I mean, he physically drove them out and he turned over uh, their tables with money on and he turned over the benches where they were selling drug doves. The chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders, they all got together and they came to Jesus and they angrily asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do this? In other words, and people like this always want to know this question. Who is behind you? Who is backing you? Who is supporting you? By what authority, they asked him, are you doing these things? And in verse 29, in verse 29 of our text, Jesus said, well, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He said John's baptism. Now, remember, John the Baptist was Jesus's cousin and he had been persecuted for preaching that the kingdom of God was near. John's baptism, Jesus said, was it from heaven or was it of human origin? Tell me. Well, the text says that they had to get together and discuss it among themselves. They said they said, now, if we say John's baptism was from heaven, then he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? which is interesting because John is the one who told them about the Christ. He told them that Christ was coming. John was the forerunner. He was the one who prepared the way in a very real sense. He was the one who prepared the environment in which Jesus did ministry. And so they said to themselves, hey, now, if we say that John's baptism was from heaven, then he will say, well, why didn't you believe him? And if we say that it was of human origin, then that will put us at odds with the people because the people believe that John was a prophet and then the people will know that we are not on their side. So after they discussed this among themselves, they said to Jesus, we don't know. 
And Jesus said, well, if you don't know the origin of John's baptism, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And right then and there, right then and there, my brothers and sisters, Jesus let them know that he did not have to answer them and that he was not accountable to them. Somebody ought to say amen right there. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ was a man who stood on his own two feet. And the reason that he didn't have to answer to, the, to men uh, uh, was because his authority and his words and the powerful signs and wonders that he did was from God. And I want you to notice something about the ministry of Jesus. Nothing that Jesus did was to enrich himself. As a matter of fact, Bible says, Bible says, Jesus himself says, and I've quoted this many times, Jesus said, I didn't come here to be served. But I came here to serve and I came here to give my life as a payment for the sins of the world. But his ministry, Jesus' ministry, my brothers and sisters, was to teach and educate people about the ways of God. His ministry was to deliver people from bondage and the self-destructive ways of the enemy. That was what Jesus' ministry was all about. Now, I don't know if you all remember, and you may not, but last year, somewhere around the month of June, I said that there was a time when I was much younger when I would study biblical prophecy, and I could not understand how the entire world uh, will be, future tense, will be deceived by a man who is called the Antichrist, someone who is against Christ, someone who opposes everything that Christ stood for. I, I, I could not understand how the entire world could be deceived by this one man. But then I also said to you that, you know, since Donald Trump won the presidency, for the first time in my life, I clearly saw how it could happen. I clearly saw up close how relatively easy it is for a man to capitalize on the lies and the deceptions of the enemy. You know, my brothers and sisters, you know, a lot of foolishness has been going on for the past four years. A lot of foolishness and a lot of foolery and a lot of excuses that would not have entertained, been entertained, had the president looked anywhere close to the way you and I look. You understand what I'm saying? But, you know, the most disappointing thing and and maybe it's not that I'm disappointing maybe that's that's not the word I'm looking for but that's that's the word I'm going to use the most disappointing thing not the most surprising thing but the most disappointing verdict on the last four years is that the president was supported and praised and even exalted and followed by an overwhelming number of evangelicals, predominantly white, but an ever-increasing number of black evangelicals. Now, now listen, these are people who go to church like we do. They study the word of God. You know, uh, their interpretation might be somewhat different, but but they, they study the word of God. What I'm trying to say is that they go to Sunday school and Bible study just like we do. Uh, they call on the name of Jesus, presumably just like we do. And yet to them, President Trump was a means to an end. I'm talking about Christians now. I'm talking about pastors and deacons and trustees and Sunday school teachers, Bible study teachers and choir members and ministry leaders who call on the name of Jesus. Right. They didn't see pres the president as someone who hated the truth, which is kind of what I saw, but, but they saw him as someone who stood for the truth, you know? I mean, his inflammatory rhetoric and, and blatant, immature, schoolyard-like behavior, say whatever I want to say just because I'm entitled, disrespect of people. It wasn't frowned upon by them. It wasn't frowned upon. Perhaps, you know, that's because, you know, President Trump was saying uh, what they wanted to say on the inside. Maybe he was saying what they wanted to say in their hearts. And so he was their spokesperson, so to speak. But even though, even though Jesus said, do unto others 
as you would have them do unto you. And, and that's the golden rule. That's what we all study. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That didn't seem to resonate with evangelicals, with the religious people, with Christian people at all. Now, the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs says there are six things that the Lord hates and, and seven that are detestable to him. It says the Lord hates a proud look, no haughty eyes, a haughty look, an arrogant look says that the Lord hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates a heart that devises wicked schemes, a uh, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You know, the Bible tells us that God is not a respecter of persons. It does not matter who you are. God detests Proverbs says that kind of behavior. Isn't that something? You know, abortion, homosexuality, securing, securing the borders of our nation against a new generation of immigrants who are not European and having a strong military. And things like that are the causes that many, many people, even evangelicals, wanted Trump to champion. But now, but now, you know, some of the moral issues in that list, they remind me of what Jesus said to the men who caught a woman in the act of adultery. You already know the story. I've talked about it before. You know, the religious leaders, the religious mafia of that day, uh, they brought uh, a woman to Jesus and they said, we caught her in the very act of adultery. And the law of Moses says that such a woman should be stoned. But what do you say? What do you say, Lord? And to make a long story short, Jesus said to them, he said, he is without sin. Why don't you throw a stone at her first? And the text tells us that one by one, they all dropped their stones from the oldest to the youngest. And they went away. They walked away. They, they left the woman right there with Jesus. But now the implication in that story, in that text, is that adultery is not the only sin for which a person could be stoned according to the law, right? And I believe that Jesus would say to us today, abortion is not the only sin for which a person could be stoned. Homosexuality is not the only sin for which a person could be stoned. And so the Bible says when everyone left Jesus with the woman alone, Jesus said to her, said, woman, where are your accusers? Has, has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. He said, go and sin no more. Now, contrary to what the world would have us to believe and the world would have us practice, Jesus didn't say to the woman, go and, you know, go and just continue to hurt yourself. Go and continue to tear up your life and tear up the lives of others and ruin your relationship with God. Why don't you just run further and further away from God? He didn't say that to the woman, but Jesus, he said to the woman, he said, go and sin no more. Now, the Bible tells us, now the Bible tells us in so many words and in so many ways that Jesus actually came into this world to save that woman, right? Jesus came into this world to save sinners. The Bible says he himself said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. As a matter of fact, Jesus was among sinners so frequently that the religious leaders, the religious mafia, called him a friend of sinners because they could not stand those people that Jesus hung out with. But let me say this. Let me say this. In spite of the fact that Jesus hung out with people and befriended people from all walks of life, I want you to understand that Jesus never, ever compromised who he was or what he believed in. But let me tell you this, instead of criticizing or complaining or condemning people, Jesus set those people free by the power of God if that was what they wanted. All right. And Jesus, he was able to operate, operate like that among the people. Uh, he, he didn't compromise sin because, my brothers and sisters, his first duty was to love God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength, and then to love his neighbor as himself. 
And so, and so in a real sense, Jesus, listen to me now, Jesus did not allow himself to be pimped out by the religious leaders or by the crowd. And I'm here to tell you this morning as the church, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, neither should we allow that to happen to us. As believers, our first allegiance is to the Father and the Son, to whom we ought to love with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might, and with all of our strength. And then our duty is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And just as a parenthetical note, loving your neighbor does not mean that you condone everything that they do, particularly if what they're doing is not in line with the word of God or the will of God. And I don't know why that throws Christians in such a quandary. You know, I love my children. I praise my children. But if they do something wrong, I say, no, no, that was wrong. Uh, you shouldn't do that. I want you to go this way. I love them. And at the same time, I can I can offer criticism to them because of my love for them. I can show them and steer them in the right direction. Why? Because I love them. All right. But now many of these evangelicals, not all of them, but many of the evangelicals right now in our country, they seem to be the sons and daughters of those, you know, who told Dr. King that he was going too far when he wrote this letter, when he wrote a letter to them from a, a jail cell right here in Birmingham. They said that he was going too far. They said that he was disturbing the peace. And they said that because they didn't care if justice was achieved for the people that he was fighting for. They didn't care about justice at all if it did not apply to them. So a large number, I'm here to tell you, a large number of these evangelicals today, particularly in the South and in the Midwest, they remind me of the religious leaders in our text. These religious leaders were far more concerned with maintaining and holding on to their power, holding on to their privilege, holding on to their status, and holding on to their money than they were about worshiping God and bringing justice to the people around them. And so the Bible tells us when Jesus drove all right. When he drove these merchants, when he drove their comrades, their partners out of the temple, at that point, they wanted to kill him. Think about that now. These religious leaders, this this religious mafia, they wanted to kill the son of God who had come into the world to save them. Right. Isn't that a shame? My brother, and my sister. If you are a member of a church whose leadership and the majority of its members think in that same vein, my question to you is, how do you think that is going to impact you spiritually, socially, and morally? How is that going to impact you? Huh? How do you think that's going to impact your children? And how will your children view themselves? And how will they view other people? Huh? Do we as a church, do we or are we supposed to love only those who love us? Do we only respect and respect, my brothers and sisters, is a form of love. Do we only respect those who we determine to be worthy of our respect? In what way, in what way do we honor Jesus and the prophets who came before him when we do that? In our text, Jesus said, he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He said, it shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He said, it shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He said, but you have made it a den of thieves. And I want to let you know this morning that thieves hate the truth. These thieves can't stand the truth. Everything that a thief does is in the darkness because he doesn't want the light to shine upon him. So the question then for us, the question for us in this present day as believers 
in the Lord Jesus Christ is, will we represent Jesus? Will we make his house? Will we make his church a place of prayer and communion and fellowship for all people, for all nations? Or, or will we make it a den of thieves and a den of lies and a place of of division. The question is, where will you stand? Will this house be a house of prayer or will it be a den of thieves? Like Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve. Will it, will it, will it be God or will it be those false gods, the gods of greed, the gods of power, the gods of earthly wealth and status. Choose you this day who you will serve. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to become a part of us. Hey, we're not a perfect church, but we're striving to be all that God would have us to be. We are striving to follow the ways of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're striving to build a house that stands upon a solid foundation, and that solid foundation is the Word of God. If what I said today, as I preach the Word, if it spoke to you and you don't have a church home, I want you to prayerfully consider this church. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I want to encourage you to give your life to him right now. If you're willing to make that commitment, I want you at this time to pray this prayer after me. Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for his sacrifice on the cross. I thank you, Lord, that he gave his life for mine. And because of that, Lord, my sin, my sins have all been cast away and they no longer stand between me and you. And so right now, Lord, I come to you and I ask, Lord, that you receive me into your kingdom, into your family so that I might be your son or so that I might be your daughter. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I believe in your message. I believe in your son. I believe in the salvation that you have offered me today. And I accept it. Receive me now, Lord, into your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, my Savior now and my Lord, I pray in his name. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, if you prayed that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, you have now embarked upon a new journey. As the Bible says, you have now been born again. But there are still some steps in the process that you need to make. You need to join a church family. And uh, if you're listening to this message and you're in the Birmingham metropolitan area, I want to encourage you to join this church, the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. I want you to join this fellowship of believers. Once you join, you need to be baptized. And after you're baptized, of course, uh, you need to sit under solid teaching. And we have that throughout this church. We have many people who are adept and skilled at teaching the word of God. They have experience in that. And, and you, need to, you need to find out, you need to discover what God's will is for your life, what God says in his word and the promises, the promises that God has made to all of his children so that you might serve him in a way that is pleasing to him. I invite you, I encourage you to do that on this day. May God bless you, my brothers and sisters. We are living in some turbulent times. But there's nothing new under the sun, right? What has happened today has happened in the past, right? What has happened in the past will happen in the future, my brothers and sisters. But we've got to stay vigilant and we've got to remember whose we are 
And we've got to remember who it is that we serve. Like the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't serve any group in particular. And we should not be afraid of man because our allegiance is to the Lord God who made both the heavens and the earth. That is who we serve. May God bless each and every one of you. And I will see you on next week. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and deliver you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy unto the only wise God be power, majesty, and dominion now, henceforth, and forever. Let the people of God say amen. God bless you.